Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, so um, ethnographers of Congo Basin hunter-gatherers have really um, conceptualized ritual as being something that's like a leveling mechanism that sustains gender egalitarianism in particular by mediating power between individuals and also um, different uh, subgroups. So for example, the two genders are two subgroups and rituals very much involved in mediating power between men's coalitions and women's coalitions um, among Congo Basin hunter-gatherers. So um, this talk of mine is really going to be about how both um, mythology and ritual are involved in mutual causal interactions with um, the politics of um, everyday non-ritual life really and um, about how um, the emergence of social and political inequality is kind of uh, interlinked causally with um, mythology and um, ritual as well. So I take it as a given that um, mythology and ritual are intertwined um, and that they uh, are, are kind of part of the same ideology and that's because um, I think that anthropologists and mythologists have over several decades conclusively uh, demonstrated that that's the case, including the work of Chris Knight, um, for most uh, human societies that ritual and mythology are closely intertwined uh, phenomena. So um, a little bit more about the Baka, um, they are um, one of several ethnic groups of um, Congo Basin hunter-gatherers who live in the Congo Basin and um, have a history of hunting and gathering um, in the rainforest over there. Um, so the Baka live on the western uh, side of the Congo Basin um, in um, Cameroon, but also in Gabon, in parts of Gabon, parts of the Congo Republic, and also um, parts of the Central African uh, Republic. You find some Baka people. But most of the, um, the Baka live in Cameroon, and the community that I worked uh, with um, were a group of people in a village called Asimdele, which is on the border actually of Cameroon and the Congo Republic. And um, the Baka are also part of a wider group called the Bayaka, um, which includes all of the ethnic groups of um, Aka and uh, Baka people, including the Mbinjele that Jerome Lewis has worked with. Um, and this group um, of people, um, Bayaka is actually an in indigenous ethnonym, uh, but um, they share, uh, so the Baka and the Aka peoples uh, share common cultural origins and um, they also share um, a large vocabulary of forest related words although they speak different languages that are borrowed from neighboring farming communities they um, share uh, this vocabulary of um, forest related words and they share a lot of similar cultural concepts and uh, ritual practices as well Okay, but um, before I uh, carry on talking about the Baka, I do want to take you back to 2009 uh, when I uh, went for a, a short master's degree uh, project um, in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo with the Mbuti, who are the, uh, the famous um, people who were made famous by Colin Turnbull's book, The Forest People. Um, okay, so um, they are... Um, people who live on the eastern side of the Democratic Republic of Congo in the eastern uh, uh, part of the Congo Basin in the eastern side of, uh, of um, so like really uh, a very far distance away from the Bayaka people in, including the Baka. But um, despite uh, being uh, separated by these vast distances in some cases they actually do share a lot of cultural practices so they have a history of um, leading a very mobile lifestyle in the forest moving from camp to camp uh, living in these little uh, um, temporary uh, huts that are igloo shaped and that are made from leaves and branches and they are very quickly constructed. They can be constructed by women in a matter of a few hours. So it's very easy for people to, uh, to just move from camp to camp actually. And um, they uh, also uh, all have a history of egalitarian politics and they all have rituals that emphasize polyphonic singing and um, so polyphonic singing is where lots of different voices join together and there are different tunes that kind of come together to make one harmony 
and um, they also all have a very similar cosmology that has forest spirits that they celebrate in these rituals and there's also a central god finger a uh, god figure um, okay um, so um, however the booty the booty are very different to the baka in that um, they still uh, have a very mobile life where the baka are more sedentarized and um, this sort of uh, uh, mobile life means that they're still very forest oriented they still do um, primarily hunting and gathering so although they do they're involved in trade relationships with neighboring farmer communities they um, they don't actually do any farming themselves they still uh, you know rely purely on hunting and gathering and trading foods for their subsistence and as a result of that, I would say their uh, egalitarianism is very much still intact, actually, including the gender um, egalitarianism. So what that means is that polygyny is, is, is quite rare and that um, women have a lot of choice in whom they marry and fathers do uh, a lot of direct child care, actually. So there you can see there's a, a married couple sitting there and the father's holding the baby and you, you kind of... It's, it's very common to see fathers actually like tending directly to children um, with the booty and also to some extent with the back I wouldn't say that that you know isn't a thing but it's very very uh, noticeable actually um, among the booty so um, what I'm going to start with then is to read you a story that I collected during that time uh, it's a wonderful story I really like it um, and uh, so okay without further ado um, it's called tortoise uh, overcomes her adversaries so one day chimpanzee met tortoise and he said to her that he wanted to marry her and tortoise wasn't very happy about this but chimpanzee was very insistent so tortoise said okay and so they decided to stay together and during the night time they went to bed but when chimp wanted to have sex with the tortoise, tortoise cut chimp's penis with the sharp edge of her shell. And then chimp started crying and thrashing around and he suffered greatly and then he died. And then tortoise left. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then tortoise uh, came next upon uh, the elephant and she said to the elephant you always say to people that you are the strongest but today I'm going to show you that I'm stronger than you and um, so the elephant started laughing a lot and he looked down at tortoise and he said um, in order to end this discussion take this rope tie it on your leg and I will tie the other end of mine and let's see who's going to be able to topple their opponent and the elephant said I'm going to show you who I am today so tortoise took her end of the rope and elephant tied the other end to his leg but tortoise had already tied her end into a big rock in the water unbeknown to elephant so the tortoise moved back into the water where she was comfortable and stood on a big rock in the water uh, on which she had tied the rope and she said let's start the game today I'm going to overcome you you will see so elephant started pulling with a lot of force and he pulled and he pulled but he didn't understand because he was pulling in vain and he couldn't he couldn't pull the, the tortoise over so tortoise started laughing at the elephant and saying go on what were, what were you going to do uh, again have you given up already speak up um, let's see where this is going so elephant pulled with uh, with more strength and he started becoming really furious and eventually he just collapsed with exhaustion but he stood up again and he stepped forward to gather enough strength to, uh, to move backwards. But he just found himself falling down and he fell down with so much force that his tusks entered into the ground and they were broken off. And then tortoise started laughing and insulting the elephant and saying, you're really stupid. <laughs> and today, today I've shown you that you're not strong. Um, and then the tortoise started beating the elephant up 
and the elephant took uh, the tortoise took a spear and stabbed the elephant and the elephant died <laughs> and then the, the tortoise moved on um, and went and found her friends the bush babies so uh, there you go uh, that that is what I would call a feminist uh, story <laughs> uh, that was <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the wrong sort of feminism, but I think it kind of, um, it's about these different coalitions really, where the, where the men are asserting their superiority and the women are uh, uh, asserting their superiority. So what are, what are the kind of elements in that story that kind of support female power, do you think? That's a question you can... Castration. <laughs> <laughs> well, the threat of castration is, is pretty severe, yeah. Cheating. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, using using the using wits to overcome physical strength. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yes. Oh, true. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, I, I hadn't even considered that. But yes, I guess uh, wetness is associated. There's all kinds with of interesting Bushman stories with tortoise with shell um, trapping the trickster's hand. Oh, that might be similar. All right, I don't, I don't remember those ones. I think I need to revisit Megan Beasley's book, yeah. maybe. But yes, um, okay. So what I also found interesting about it is that uh, Tortoise is resisting the sort of pressure to marry someone against her will, and I think that's one of the key things about gender egalitarianism is that women have a choice really about who they want to marry but in many other traditional societies women don't have that much choice actually and they uh, they are um, they go into arranged marriages basically and they sometimes uh, are under pressure to actually be forced to go into those marriages especially if um, there's a high status uh, man who really wants to marry that person so I think this is kind of asserting that that's not an acceptable thing to women and that you know um, they could retaliate even perhaps by castrating the person who's, who's trying to harass them into um, into marriage and, and then the other thing is this idea that physical strength, just because uh, males are, m might be bigger, larger, and have more physical strength, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are politically superior. Um, that actually, you know, through, through using their wits, that women can actually uh, maybe even turn men's uh, physical strength against them. So, you know, I, I really loved that. And uh, the reason that I'm, I'm giving you this story is because the Baka people don't actually, um, of, the, of the different um, tales that I collected, there aren't many like that among the Baka, unfortunately. So um, I am going to tell you a little bit about Baka mythology, but nothing quite like this exists as far as I'm aware actually among the Baka but I just wanted to give this to you so that you can contrast it uh, in your minds. Okay so um, some other key concepts that um, are kind of theoretical that I'd like you to think about. Um, this idea of mutual causal interaction or feedback loops so that's really just the idea that although um, we, you know, in our um, scientific uh, uh, and scholarly models, we really like things to be simple, that um, in the real world, things aren't simple, they're messy, they're complex. And um, it's the idea that um, uh, causality isn't necessarily a linear process where factor A affects factor B and that you can directly attribute um, whatever's going on in factor B to factor A. Um, that actually sometimes you'll find that factors A and B are caught up in, um, in different feedback loops, uh, circular and entwined, entangled processes of causality. And then the idea of equilibrium is also about systems. Um, it's uh, the idea that um, when you have a system that's stable, it's in that equilibrium position. And um, it's when different competing influences that are going on in a system are, um, are equal to each other so that you have a stable system that isn't uh, changing, it's um, in equilibrium. Uh, the idea of complementarity and interdependence, this is uh, derived actually quite a lot from Jerome Lewis's work with Mbengele where um, uh, you know, um, there's this ideology of uh, interdependence between the two genders, and I think it's not uh, unique. 
into uh, Congo Basin hunter-gatherers. It's actually, you know, something that you find in a lot of human societies where there's this idea that women and men kind of support each other. Um, but um, so um, uh, really um, we can think of this in terms of both the biological and social roles of men and women. So. Um, uh, the female and male sex are kind of different because they've got different gametes um, where you have uh, an egg which is is kind of large and costly to produce and a female can only produce a, a very limited number of those eggs uh, and then the the male gamete the sperm is um, smaller and it is uh, relatively less costly to produce, so lots of them can be prepared, can be uh, produced, and it's it's quite mobile. So its role is to to kind of be mobile and to find the egg. And the role then of the egg is something different. It contains nutrients that are important for the blastocyte as it's developing before it attaches itself to the lining of the uterus. So there's a kind of um, division of labor between those two things in fertilization uh, that is complementary or um, that it has interdependence, that they, they kind of need each other. Non neither of them are, are completely um, independent actually but no one is more is more dependent on the other than um, so it balances out basically uh, so um, analogous to this is uh, the uh, gender division of labor in many hunting and gathering societies so really um, this isn't true of all hunting ga hunting and gathering societies but in general you'll find that men are more responsible for um, hunting and for honey collection and that uh, women tend to be involved in the collection of plant foods, in the collection of small mammals, insects, fish, and they're also the primary um, direct uh, childcare providers. Uh, men also get involved to some extent, but um, uh, women are the primary caregivers, really. So you have that kind of um, division of labor, and then you have um, people being sort of quite conscious of the fact that there's that division of labor and that interdependence or complementarity. Um, okay, then a ritual dialogue model. So that's a term that I've used to refer to the kind of ritual interactions that are very common among Congo Basin hunter-gatherers, uh, where you have these male and female coalitions who compete with one another um, in a way that sustains gender e equality and it emphasizes that um, interdependence between the two uh, genders. And um, it, it's a kind of model where each uh, coalition the male and the female coalition will uh, temporarily assert their own superiority and it goes backwards and forwards like that. Okay, so then uh, talking about going, now moving to the Baka community that I worked with for my PhD research. Um, the field work was conducted in 2011 and 2012 with uh, the Baka villages of Sumdele and um, this is, as I said, on the border of Cameroon and the Congo Republic. And I chose this, com this particular community because I wanted to study the emergence of inequality. And um, this particular community, compared with other Baka people um, in Cameroon, they were relatively isolated, actually. So um, although uh, it's a sedentary village, um, the, the, the Baka component of Sumdele it is, uh, has only been there since um, the 1970s or n early 1980s, according to the life histories of, of senior residents of the Asumdele community. And that's compared with a sedentarized life going back to the 1950s or the 1960s for most Baka people. Um, and um, those Baka people uh, currently live nearby to um, roads that have been very long established. So there was no road in this community up until uh, very recently. Okay, but um, just the fact of being sedentarized had led to some changes. So being sedentarized um, means that they came into daily contact um, with 
the Njem people who are one of the groups of, uh, of farmers in the region. And um, so um, Asumdele is divided into an Njem part and a Baka part. And um, the, they, they have these uh, relationships of cooperation, but also of competition with uh, the, the Njem people or other farming groups. And that, that kind of relationship um, is based on inequality and discrimination, actually. And the, the, the Baka people are generally seen as being lower in status. So um, there's this kind of long history of these trade relationships um, that, that, goes out, that goes back you know, many hundreds of years at least, and probably thousands. But um, they've become increasingly uh, relationships of inequality, where you have a patron-client kind of um, system going on. And that's due to the fact that the farming peoples actually became more and more um, into big man politics. So they've got this long history of having not egalitarian politics, but having big man politics where you have um, high status men who have a lot of subordinate individuals as part of their households. And um, as a result of uh, coming into sort of daily contact uh, as a result of sedentarization, um, the Baka people have, have come to feel that they don't want to be in that inferior position, that they want to have the same status as these other people that they are interacting with so closely. And so this has led to a lot of emulation of the big man politics of uh, the NGEM and the breakdown of egalitarian um, politics. So men in particular, um, in order not to feel emasculated, they, they, they kind of copy the, the more patriarchal practices of the neighboring and gem people. Okay, and then more recently, um, in 2000, by 2006, an Australian mining company, big multinational actually, but based in Australia, began establishing an iron ore mine very near to Sumdele in a village about three kilometers away. They started building their headquarters. And um, by 2008, uh, a very basic dirt road had been established. And as a result of this, the whole community uh, having been really quite isolated, uh, suddenly became exposed to an abundance of goods, an inflow of money, new technologies. For example, um, you know, they started to see things like electric generators coming in and um, other things like motorbikes and um, uh, trucks coming through. Uh, because of the road to do logging and um, helicopters going over to the mining headquarters, um, caterpillars making roads, uh, things, things that were, were quite new to them. And so this has all contributed to changes in social organization, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a moment. But it's also important to recognize that at the same time, a lot of the egalitarian kind of uh, tradition still continues. So this over here, you can see uh, a man called Dindo, which means baby. Uh, and he's, he, he had a very baby-like and sweet temperament, um, uh, Dindo. And he was very close to his wife and they used to do a lot of things together. So there he's helping her to uh, weave a basket. And this is in the forest, so this is um, where the more uh, sort of traditional egalitarian lifestyle tends to reassert itself, really. Um, so um, in the village, you see more of the, the, the kind of patriarchal lifestyle. And then in, if you go into the forest, um, then you have a, a slightly different lifestyle kind of uh, that coexists, actually, <coughs> with this other village lifestyle. And you also get a lot of ambivalence um, and contradiction characterizing the, the kind of uh, thoughts and behavior of uh, the Baka people in Asumdele. So they have um, a lot of mixed feelings about the past, but also of the present and the future and what their place is going to be in the modern world. So sometimes they'll denigrate the, 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 the traditions of the past, the past way of life and say, you know, they don't want that anymore. But then they'll also be very uncertain about the future and the modern world and some of the negative side of, uh, of, of that uh, that they're quite aware of. 
Okay, so let me talk a little bit about changing uh, kinship um, patterns. So, um, in general, uh, what's happening is they're going from a, a cognatic uh, kind of kinship structure to a more patrilineal one. Um, so, um, the back in general are described by um, other ethnograph uh, other anthropologists such as Barry Hewlett as having um, a, a kind of patrilineal system with um, <laughs> patrilocal post residents. Uh, but the uh, Sumdele Baka are uh, a little bit different to that and perhaps because that's um, uh, due to the fact that they've been quite isolated and that their sedentarization has been fairly recent. So instead of having a predominantly a patrilineal kind of system where a person belongs to their father's clan and inherit, uh, uh, property is inherited uh, from father to son, they actually have a system that's kind of nominally uh, patrilineal in that um, okay you belong to your father's clan but you also um, belong to your mother's clan and um, also um, uh, uh, you have um, um, a situation where um, people are actually living uh, either with uh, the mothers, the, 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 the women's side of the family or the man's side of the family uh, more or less equally actually. So um, that's the, the, the post-marital residence situation. So um, when uh, a married couple uh, gets married in a patrilocal society they'd go and live with uh, the groom's um, family uh, in his residence group and um, he'd take the, his bride away from her family basically and um, we know that really um, a lot of egalitarian hunter-gatherer societies don't really do that and there's actually a tendency to stay with the mother's side of the family especially in early marriage because they have um, bride service um, and bride service is uh, the system where um, the groom has to actually work for um, his in-laws for a period of a few years and during that time actually um, it's quite common that the first a child is born in that marriage so it it, it kind of uh, functions to um, allow the young mother access to her own blood kin or her consanguineous uh, kin during that time okay but what you see is um, that um, bride wealth is, is starting to become more important and bride wealth is different to bride service because it, it's got a couple of political Im implications. It's where um, a sum of money or some goods are actually exchanged at the time of marriage from um, the, uh, the, the groom's parents to the bride's parents. And unfortunately um, it can create a kind of sense of ownership over the bride, over the wife. And it, it also um, it, it tends to exacerbate uh, polygynous marriages because um, if, if a man can afford to marry more than one wife by paying bride wealth, he can do so. So it leads to actually economic competition between different men which can create in turn uh, household wealth inequality and it also uh, tends to create a slightly uh, um, less egalitarian kind of um, relationship between a husband and wife because this idea of having paid bride wealth um, can create that sense uh, of ownership. It also makes divorce a little bit more difficult because the bride wealth uh, has to be returned. So um, uh, very often you'll find that you know a woman who wants to leave a marriage her family would have to return that bride wealth and um, her own family would be reluctant to actually do that or they don't have the money anymore and so she just doesn't really have a place to go to necessarily she can't go back to her own family and um, so um, with the Baka community you see that both bride service 
and bride wealth are, are features. Um, some marriages are based purely on bride service and others um, have uh, bride wealth and you get different kinds of scales of bride wealth from only token bride wealth to actually considerable sums of money that are being exchanged. And that kind of inflation of bride wealth can cause a lot of uh, competition actually, like reproductive competition as well as uh, economic competition. And um, so with the, it's interesting, the Sumdele community actually have quite a low polygyny ra rate at the time that I was doing my field work. It was a 1.48% uh, uh, or one in uh, a total of uh, 48 men in the community, uh, only one man was actually uh, married to two wives. And that contrasts with a different rate of 18.5% for Baka in general, which um, has been, been obtained by another anthropologist, uh, Barry Hewlett. So actually, polygyny among this relatively isolated group had been quite low. But as more and more cash flows in and uh, people you know, um, start to become more or less successful economically, then I can, you, you can expect that some men will be able to uh, marry polygynously at the expense of other men who are less uh, successful e economically. So um, that wasn't quite happening at the moment. Uh, except that, as I'll show you in a moment, the, uh, the man who was married uh, polygynously is also the wealthiest uh, man currently in the community. Um, okay, so this is just, I, don't, I, I want to skip over this, I don't have a lot of time. This is just to show you that actually um, the makeup of the village is uh, not a, strict, a strictly uh, patrilocal one which you would expect of a patrilineal community because um, the pie charts at the, the two top pie charts show the different clan makeup uh, on the left uh, it's the the father's clan <coughs> and on the right it's the mother's clan of different individuals who live in the village and um, if it was a completely patrilocal system, you'd expect uh, to see one clan really dominating within that residence group or village, actually. And you don't see that. So, uh, but you do see that perhaps there are bigger uh, groups of uh, closely related men who belong to the same clan, slightly living uh, um, together. Uh, on the father's side than on the mother's side. So the, the Patri clans of, uh, of the men, um, you get like a slightly uh, larger chunk of that pie chart living together. So it shows that, you know, uh, Patri local residence is becoming uh, perhaps a little bit more common than uh, the matrilocal uh, version where people would live with the bride's uh, side of the family. And then the pie chart at the bottom is just about, um, I asked people about their emotional closeness to the different sides of the family. Um, and um, the, the blue part there uh, are people saying that they're emotionally close to both sides of, uh, of their family. Their mothers and their fathers' sides are equally important to them. So it shows that they still have this kind of uh, bilateral orientation. But then the beige part shows uh, people who said that they're closer to their father's side of the family. So again, uh, this emergence of uh, patrilocal kind of kinship orientation. And with inheritance, there was a similar kind of thing. Most, uh, mostly uh, both men and women can inherit property and they inherit property from both their mothers and their fathers, but there was a slight tendency of people saying that they could only uh, inherit um, from their fathers, especially, and, and, and sometimes only um, the, the sons could inherit from their fathers in a few cases. So you see this kind of um, copying of that exact kinship pattern that um, the in-gen practice that's coming into the Spucker community. Okay, then I also did a property survey where I got Gini coefficients um, by counting up everything that a particular household had. So they don't have like nuclear families, they've got uh, more extended households which can um, be uh, from anything to a small, like it, can, it could be a small nuclear family but in general they, they're larger, more extended uh, households. And um, 
I counted uh, up everything that they had in their houses from teaspoons to plastic buckets to you know everything except for clothing um, which is just too personal and cash which is something that can be hidden away very easily so I don't think people were going to be very honest about that and I also um, surveyed uh, they do uh, the backer people uh, perhaps I didn't mention they do mixed subsistence so they're doing a lot of farming so if they had a farm then I would include like how many farms they had in the total uh, amount for that household and um, they also do artisanal gold mining so if they had a gold mining site that was included I included how many houses uh, belonged to that household and what the size of the household was so really quite extensively trying to um, account for everything that could be classed as uh, the property of that household and um, I came up with a Gini coefficient um, for different household, household wealth um, but weighted for the number of adults per household. So the average uh, household wealth per adult would have been about um, 63,000 uh, Central African francs, which is about 82 pounds. So not a lot of money. Uh, they, you know, they're very poor. They don't have a lot of stuff. But the Gini coefficient was actually quite high. So 0 0.31. Um, okay, that's similar to what we have in the UK at the moment um, in 2015, um, uh, which is 0 0.33 according to the World Bank. Um, so Gini coefficient is just a statistical measure of inequality, basically. Um, so zero is uh, where you would have um, a case of um, uh, real um, equality. So if all the households um, were had the exact same amount of wealth, then th that would be a, a Gini coefficient of zero. If uh, all of the property was owned by one household you'd have a Gini coefficient of one so uh, 0 0.31 um, is you know it's it's quite high um, and then if you look at um, really uh, just the Gini coefficient between men within a household I don't want to get into the, the stats of that too much it goes it, it becomes even higher it becomes um, 0 0.72 and the reason for that is because it's the men who are really benefiting from the influx of cash into the economy. Uh, the, the kind of work that they do is much uh, more easily converted into cash. So they do things like uh, uh, hunting, which can easily be converted into the bushmeat trade, or ivory can, e you know, has a, a cash price. The artisanal gold mining is done mostly by men because it's very hard labor. Actually, it requires a lot of upper body strength. They have to dig up tons and tons of soil. So it's something that's, you know, um, done only by men really, and also. Um, if they do uh, waged labor for uh, for neighbors or for the mine the men get paid a higher rate uh, because uh, they they're better laborers basically so really um, uh, the men's work is uh, translated into um, a, a kind of um, economic wealth in a way that the women's labor isn't so the women's women are working very hard but what they're doing is um, things like uh, you know doing the actual not clearing the farms but doing the farming and bringing the vegetable foods home to feed their families um, and they um, are doing things like child care and they're doing things like fetching uh, firewood and collecting water and things like that so they they don't you know have as much uh, expendable income and you see that very much you see that you know the men are um, starting to afford things like portable radios and uh, they're drinking a lot of alcohol so they spend a lot of uh, of their money on on that whereas the women are kind of actually doing a lot of provisioning so um, really uh, the economic inequality is kind of um, mostly uh, uh, a situation where the the men have uh, an economic advantage over the women actually and that's going to actually translate into um, 
in the inflation of bride wealth as well probably in the future which is then going to compound the gender uh, inequality but it also leads to uh, differences in household wealth so you have different men kind of competing with each other actually and as I said the the the, the wealthiest household um, had a central figure who uh, was um, very uh, politically uh, kind of of high status actually because he'd been um, given the role of chief by the government he was educated um, in um, a Catholic uh, boarding school so he wasn't actually from that community but had some uh, kinship attachment to it and he uh, was was kind of accumulating wealth actually and he had a very large household really so uh, you can see that kind of economic inequality between men and women and between different men arising with the bucca Okay, so um, earlier I mentioned uh, mutual causal interaction um, or feedback loops, um, which is this idea that um, you know uh, causality isn't really uh, very linear. So uh, I, I was going to show you a short video about this, but I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see if it works. <laughs> oh no, it's not. Hang on. Okay, let me go back. Um, if, if you're prepared not to have it, I can, I can, I can skip it. Actually, I think I'm going to skip it because I, I still want to read you some more stories. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it is, uh, it is something uh, important to think about because you get two different kinds of um, feedback. You get positive feedback and negative uh, feedback. And um, positive feedback is where you uh, have a kind of uh, causality loop where um, you have changes from a previous condition. So you have um, a situation where you've maybe got a system that's going on like an ecosystem uh, and um, one factor is leading to another factor that compounds a particular situation and causes a lot of change to happen. Uh, so um, if you think about the formation of an ecosystem, um, you have plants growing and then um, the, the plants die and they go into the soil and they fertilize the soil and, and provide nutrients to the soil, which means a lot of other plants can grow. and. Um, in in the future and then you know this, this keeps on going so that more and more plant the, the soil becomes more fertile and um, more and more plants can grow and that's kind of a, a, um, a positive feedback loop where you have change happening and it could it could be beneficial or it could be not so beneficial so the same thing can happen with deforestation if um, a lot of trees are chopped down then there is less fertilization going into the soil and it makes it more difficult for other plants to grow. So you have uh, the, that kind of feedback loop where uh, a lot of change is going on. A negative feedback loop is where you have different forces counteracting each other. So uh, it's um, two forces acting in, uh, in opposite directions which creates a system of equilibrium over time. So um, predator-prey relationships um, control, you have a controlled population uh, of predator and prey because think for example um, if a fox predates on rabbits the rabbit population goes down in number but then that will mean that it can sustain fewer foxes and the fox population number will also go down that allows the rabbit population in turn to recover and grow again and then that's going to feed the foxes so they kind of keep each the, the two populations kind of keep each other in check so that's a negative feedback loop and um, we can think okay so this works for ecosystems but we can also think about this uh, with regard to um, the social sciences and social systems so um, a recent example that I saw that I really liked is uh, one that's been that, that comes from complex systems theory. There's a mathematician uh, who has um, her name's Carolyn Wiesner, and she's at Bristol, by the way, and she's looking at um, 
democracies and how stable they are over time. So uh, she kind of has looked at the fact uh, of economic inequality as a kind of uh, a problem that is destabilizing uh, democracies and creating a kind of positive feedback loop over there. Because um, if a certain group of people has more money, they can do things like own uh, a media corporation and um, that changes uh, the, the kind of nature, uh, the founding nature of a, a democracy which is the idea of equal political representation. But if uh, economic inequality exists then billionaires can own uh, media corporations and um, they then get to uh, disproportionately uh, represent their own uh, interests in the media and they can do that um, overtly by like direct ownership of Fox News or whatever uh, or they could do that covertly so I think uh, most of you will have heard about dark money so that's this this process of uh, you know um, covertly funding things like lobbying groups and uh, that you who don't disclose who's funding them and they um, <coughs> then um, get to advise government policy and so on and this kind of thing is is actually like a positive feedback loop because it's also uh, bringing more money to those billionaires and more influence and it can keep on going like that so that's a destabilizing kind of positive feedback loop um okay so um then it, then then what, what what starts to happen so what's happening in, in democracies that's destabilizing democracies is that people start losing faith in the institutions and the institutions of democracy like parliamentary democracy actually start to change their fundamental nature so uh, you have um, you know a, a situation where these lobbying groups are you know uh, advising parliament in ways that aren't necessarily uh, in the interests uh, of all of the citizens but actually are, are perhaps uh, a disproportionate uh, um, interests of, uh, of wealthy people and corporations. And um, it's that change uh, uh, of institutions that I want you to kind of uh, think a little bit about because I'm going to talk now about Bar Yaka ritual and myth. And I want you to think about those as being kind of political institutions in a way that um, keep egalitarianism going um, traditionally and that they are changing because they involved in a positive feedback loop um, actually with the other kinds of social inequality that are coming in that I've told you about kinship is changing and um, you have economic inequality happening and the subsistence practice is changing so all of those things I, I, I argue are kind of in a positive feedback loop with ritual in the case of uh, the Baka Okay, so um, let's think about that uh, ritual dialogue model that I um, mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Uh, so the central matter for that, and this is based on the work of other people like Jerome Lewis and Morna Finnegan, that who've worked a lot uh, on the ritual of Congo Basin hunter-gatherers, that um, really it, it, this uh, the situation that in ritual you have a female coalition and you have a male coalition and you have this kind of ritualized competition between these two different ritual groups is like a pendulum um, where you have power that's going um, from the female coalition to the male coalition in, in, in ritual form. So um, for example the Mbuti uh, myth would be um, that I, that I uh, spoke of, that I told you at the beginning uh, of the talk uh, is an example of a kind of um, ritualized female dominance that would be counteracted by the equivalent male kind of stories. And in ritual you, you kind of uh, see a lot of this. Uh, during the polyphonic singing you get different spirits and the spirits are gendered. So um, some of the spirits are male spirits and some of the spirits are, uh, are, are kind of women spirits that only the, 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 the women are initiated into that uh, spirit group uh, can interact with uh, closely and they have secrets that are um, women's secrets or men's secrets. 
So the overall effect of this is that it emphasizes uh, complementarity or interdependence between the two genders. <coughs> okay, so um, if you think about a pendulum, it consists basically of a bob that's attached to a, a, a string from a rigid support and uh, in order to set the kind of swinging oscillations in motion you displace the bob from what's called the equilibrium point and th it's the equilibrium point because in that system it's the point that it's normally that the bob is normally in it's just hanging down there because of due to gravity but if you want to displace it from uh, the equilibrium point by pulling it back you're exerting a force and so by exerting that force uh, you then set up a counter force because it's attached to the string so it's it's like power is going from the female coalitions to the male coalitions but it keeps on returning to that uh, equilibrium point basically and but I want you to think about what would happen if the string got broken and someone displaced the bob then then that that backwards and forwards motion wouldn't wouldn't occur anymore the the bob would just fly off into space basically so uh, you know the string is analogous really to if you think about this this kind of oscillation of power between males and females that is always kind of uh, centered around an equilibrium point and kind of sustains gender egalitarianism. That happens in ritual, but it also happens in everyday life. And um, you can think about new social forces coming in that are so powerful that it actually changes the institutions in a way. And it, it, it's like breaking those institutions or, or changing them so fundamentally that it would be equivalent to breaking the string and, ch and, and changing that so that uh, this equilibrium is no longer maintained in the system, if that makes sense. Okay, so in other words, ritual and myth are mechanisms that keep uh, egalitarian gender politics in a constant negative uh, feedback loop, but something, you know, uh, social forces uh, can come along and actually fundamentally change that. All right, and that's an idea that I explored in a paper in 2015 about Bakker rituals specifically, but not really taking into account uh, mythology. Um, where I asked about what, what, it, what happens to that ritual uh, kind of leveling dynamic and the ritual dialogue model when um, you start to have uh, political inequality emerging and um, you, you know you had an egalitarian society but now things you, you're having social change and inequalities coming in and there I argued that um, alterations to ritual structure and performance are, uh, are best viewed as a kind of um, positive um, feedback loop where you have um, a kind of social c crisis that is experimented with uh, in ritual. So this is um, over here you see a more traditional ritual, it's one of the male uh, spirit play rituals uh, called Mboa Mboa and um, these are, are, are the Mboa Mboa spirits, they're normally twinned and they um, they kind of uh, ride they're comical spirits so they're very funny they ride around on the ground and they you know um, they speak in these really gruff like exaggeratedly masculine voices and they shout obscene things at the women and then the women sometimes shout obscene kinds of insults and things back at these at these spirits so that this kind of uh, traditional ritual um, is still going on but you see something else is happening as well and um, you um, are starting to see that um, actually um, there, there are new things that are being experimented with in ritual so um, there are two mechanisms by which uh, ritual is actually changing um, and um, I've, uh, I've kind of conceptualized that as a process of infusion and also of rebellion. So um, 
the first uh, me mechanism uh, by which rituals actually change is uh, the infusion of new values and new goods into the society as a whole. So um, the Baka people uh, at Asumdele, they would, uh, especially the young men, would, um, because there's a new road, there's uh, an emerging border town nearby, about 7.5 kilometers away, which is also a truck stop. And there's a nightclub uh, over there that um, they would walk to, actually. They'd uh, walk that distance just to attend this nightclub and go and drink alcohol and, uh, you know, rub shoulders with the truck drivers and um, prostitutes who are there over from the Congo, you know, to cash in on the, on the truck drivers and other small-scale uh, entrepreneurs. And you have this pop music playing. And it's just, it's, it's a disco, basically. Um, but it's, you know, it's very different from the kind of polyphonic rituals. And then they are actually taking aspects of that with this pop music and bringing it back to the village. So for some uh, important ritual events, they will um, collect money from uh, all members of the, of the community and they hire uh, an electric generator and a sound system and they play pop music actually instead of doing the polyphonic singing and uh, you know uh, w with the with the spirits that come out and dance and this um, is also an occasion uh, where um, the neighboring and gem people come along and they sell these like plastic uh, little sachets of alcohol so the you know it becomes a kind of um, thing where people are drinking a lot and sometimes fights break out and um, you also get people kind of um, dressing up in flashy sort of you know, clothes. So for them, uh, that, that's kind of this hip hop style with caps and uh, you know, glittery things as well. Um, it tends to be the men who dress in kind of glittery sort of disco gear. Um, but it's, it's a kind of a way of um, demonstrating status. And it's a way of actually experimenting with this idea of status, uh, I argue, uh, and um, of political inequality. Because if you think about it, the, uh, the actual um, polyphonic um, kinds of rituals are about um, experimenting with inequality in a way, but it's always a, a case where you have two equal groups, the two gender groups, and the power al always levels out between them. Over here, it, it, it's something a little bit different. It's, uh, it's a less kind of conservative uh, kind of experimentation that actually is in this positive feedback loop with other <coughs> aspects of social life, really. <coughs> and so you have a situation where they're using ritual to kind of try and understand all of these new things that are coming into their community but the ritual in the, the, the nature of the institution of ritual is actually itself changing so that it's it no longer has that sort of governing function where it's demonstrating to people that you know equality is really what we want at the end after we've experimented with you know this this different thing where um, the female coalition may be dominating at one moment but at the next moment you're going to find that the the male coalition dominates and it all equals out instead uh, there's something else over here going on and it's not even really about gender relations so much because um, when they do do the um, the spirit play rituals nowadays it tends to be mostly the male, um, the, the men's um, rituals that get performed and not so m much of the, 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 the women's rituals. Okay, so um, that's the idea uh, of influx. And then rebellion is, is um, uh, using a, an idea from an old anthropologist called uh, Max Gluckman, who had the idea that really um, ritual has a kind of cathartic effect so um, you very often in um, the rituals of um, uh, hierarchical societies uh, during ritual uh, they'll experiment with um, uh, the idea of egalitarianism in ritual and that that's kind of seen uh, was seen by uh, Max Gluckman as a conservative thing that actually kept the status quo in place 
um, by um, by kind of releasing the tension from um, uh, from um, political inequality in a ritualized way, so that the status quo could just continue. But then subsequent theor theorists like Victor Turner came along and said, well, actually, you know, if the conditions are right, then that kind of ritual egalitarianism that gets experimented with can actually become disruptive to the status quo and actually lead to a revolution or uh, an overturn of the leadership uh, because um, it's got momentum from outside of um, the ritual world. And so that's kind of what's happening with the Baka, except that what, you know, what, what's happening is that they uh, that that um, the conservative force was always sort of rituals of uh, of uh, egalitarianism, which explored inequality, and now actually what is happening is they're experimenting um, with actually um, having the r the ritual change uh, going in the direction of inequality. So it's inequality, you know, the inequality that they are experimenting with in the ritual is something that's actually going to change the egalitarian social order to one that is uh, less equal. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk now about uh, two origins myths. Uh, they're both um, Bayaka origins myths. The one is um, really uh, one from Jerome and Lewis, that Jerome Lewis uh, had encountered among them Benjele and the other one is a very similar version that I collected with the Baka. So I want you to listen very carefully to these uh, two different uh, myths because I'm going to point out similarities, important similarities and differences between them but I'm going to do that by like asking you to you know um, point out similarities and differences. So we'll start with uh, the Benjele uh, origins myth okay so it was collected by Jerome Lewis during his field work of 1996 to 2001 uh, and he told a, a synthesized version uh, which um, w where he reports that um, this myth begins with uh, Komba, who is actually the god uh, for both the Baka and the, the Aka people, uh, having uh, created uh, people and putting men and women in different parts of the forest. And um, it's set at a time when um, the men lived on their own and they could only have sex by uh, having sex with the, this kind of fruit that has a hard shell like a calabash shell uh, called mapombe fruit and the women lived in a different part of the forest uh, and they, uh, they, they sustained themselves by fishing and collecting vegetable foods while the men were doing their hunting on their side of the forest and uh, the women um, made babies by dancing with this particular spirit called the Ejengi. And the Ejengi um, spirit is still a very important um, spirit that looks like that. Uh, and he celebrated um, in one of the most important, probably the most important uh, kind of rit ritual event uh, for the Baka and the Mbenjele, uh, he's called the Jengi. So um, in this, this kind of mythical world, the women would reproduce by uh, dancing with a Jengi, basically. Okay. Um. Oh, do you, do you want to say some? I mean, I'm going to read this uh, this thing from uh, from from yours, but do you do want to do it. <laughs> okay. So the spokesman of the men's group was called uh, Tolly, and uh, normally the men hunted together. But one day, Tolly decided to go hunting alone, and he walked far into the forest. And after much walking, he found himself walking up a forest stream, and he saw a piece of broken yam floating on the water. And he said to himself, "Ah, people must be up there." And he decided to walk upstream and uh, follow, uh, retrace the yam's journey. So he walked up many streams, up and up and up he went, 
And finally, as he, he approached the headwaters of the stream, he heard voices. And stealthily he approached and he saw women who were washing the yams. And he observed this new type of people uh, for several hours. He saw their camp. He even watched them dancing with the Ejengi spirit and he saw the babies falling out of Ejengi's uh, raffia dress. And he was amazed and he rushed back to the men's camp and he recounted all that he had seen. But at first they didn't believe him and they insisted that he take them to see for themselves. So the next morning the men prepared themselves and each took a leaf parcel of honey um, along with him. And then as they approached the women, they heard singing. And um, they used an encircling technique that they used to, uh, in hunting to encircle um, wild pigs. And they surrounded the women. And Torley was the one who led the attack. And he took hold of the spokesperson of the women's group. And he beat her on the shoulders with his piece of honeycomb. And in turn, each man grabbed uh, each woman and beat her with honeycomb. And at first, the women fought against this, but then they stopped and they, they you know, got to taste the honey and they decided, oh, it's so tasty. Uh, who are these people with, this, with these sweet things, such sweetness, wonderful sweetness? I will follow them to get such sweetness. So, um, they decided to start making friends with the men and to go with the men. And each man found a woman and then they all went back to the women's camp. And then the men decided to throw away the mapombo fruit that they'd been having sex with. And then later the women told the men to stay in camp while they went off to go and do something. And at that time the women started to dance their Ajengi dance. But the men found them and then they demanded to have a jengi for themselves. And the women were actually forced to give uh, the men a jengi. And by taking a jengi, the men obliged uh, the women to make love to them in order to have children in the future. And then there's another uh, version of this myth actually among the Mbenjele. And it's the women's version of this exact same myth. Um, so the women's version of the myth begins in the same way as that of the men's version with the men and women living in different parts of the forest and they didn't know that each other existed up until this point. Um, okay, so um, in this version, Tolly isn't a man, uh, Tolly is a woman. Okay, so Tolly was the person who led men to the women. Tolly had a dream in which God or Komba told her about the men. And when all the women were out fishing, Tolly left them to walk alone in the forest. And she went to find the men. And then there's a song that the women sing at that part, um, which, uh, which has a chorus. She went out to find the men. There's Tolly. There she is. Um, and eventually, after much walking, she came across the tracks of the men. And the men were hunting, so she followed them. And there she saw the men were having sex with the mapombe fruit. And that evening, she entered their camp. And then uh, when, when the men saw her, they all got erect penises. And then um, there's normally a song that uh, that celebrates that part of, uh, of the story, which goes, when Tolly came, they all stood up. <laughs> <laughs> so she had sex with all of the men, and then she told them about her friends back at her camp. And the next morning they left early, and Tolly led them back to the women's camp. And each man took a parcel of honey with him. And then upon arrival, the women uh, were a little bit undecided about the men. They didn't think the men were very nice until they tasted the honey. And then they decided that the men were nice and each woman took a man for uh, herself. And at that point, the men threw away the mapombe fruit. And the women uh, told the men that they should stay in the camp and they were going to go and um, dig up uh, the, the yam roots. But one of the men decided to follow the woman into the forest 
and then to his surprise he saw that the women were dancing with a jengi and he saw babies falling out of their leaves and he was really impressed with this and he ran back to camp and told the men and then the men said to themselves oh, that's something that we really want so they went to the women that, and they demanded that they be given the Ajengi spirit and the women said fine we'll give it to you there you go have the Ajengi spirit so that's how men came to have Ajengi as their most important spirit that they celebrate in rituals okay so that's the Mbinjele version um, the Baka version is very similar but it also has uh, some differences and I um, had a slight, I collected a slightly longer version than that. Uh, I think, Jerome, you heard the story many, many times over and you just synthesized it to make it quite short. Is that right? There are longer versions. They're longer versions, right, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, containing a lot more detail. But anyway, this is the only, I only ever heard this myth one time. And I only heard a men's version, actually. I never heard a, a women's version of this myth. It might exist, but I, I never heard it told. Okay, uh, so um, the cultural hero for the Baka is called Waito. So once upon a time, Waito left his village and went hunting on his own deep in the forest. He followed a little river downstream and he heard voice, voices which he followed. Eventually he came to them. The women were preparing to leave the river and he ran and he caught up to them. A young woman looked at him and she said, Ha! Huh, Waito is here. Waito was really surprised that she knew his name. He asked the woman, Where do you people come from? And she replied, Waito, first go and hunt a Red River hog for us. We're leaving now. <laughs> so Waito went off along down the river and the women heard him leave and they left the river, they washed the fish that they had caught and they took the path home. And when Waita returned and, fo and followed their wet fo footprints, he came to a, a, a dead end in their track. The women had disappeared, so he left. And when he eventually arrived home, the other men wanted to question him, but he went to, men, he went to bed directly, which made them suspect that he had found something interesting that day. The next morning, he left at daybreak and returned to the spot where he had found the women. And when they arrived, he snuck up on them. And however, one of them said, Oi, ha, huh, it's Waito. And he thought to himself, how do these women know me? How do they know my name? And then he saw a red river hog. And then another. And then he noticed that his penis had become erect. But when he tried to approach the women, they ran off in the direction that they had come from. So Waito went back to the other men feeling really downcast and he tried again the next day but the same thing happened when he tried to follow their path to, to where they'd gone to. Um, it just led to this dead end. So then he went to see the sunbird and that's what a sunbird looks like. It's like a hummingbird. And when he arrived at sunbird's place, Sun, sunbird already knew that Waito, why Waito was there and what he had come from. He said, I know you. I know you've been among those other people over there and I, the sunbird, will instruct you. So listen without interrupting, sit down. Sunbird said, they're deceiving you with those red river hogs. So he gave Waita a rope and some magic gum and he said, if they keep deceive deceiving you with these red river hogs, go and hide near the entrance to their place and there you'll find a huge termite mound when you get there. You smear this magic paste that I'm giving you on the termite mound, mound and you'll see a path opens up. So Waito went home and told the other men everything that had happened. And the men were really skeptical at that point. So Waito decided to bide his time. And when he was ready, he went back to the place in the river where he'd found the women washing their fish. He crept up slowly again and the woman said to him go and look for red river hog over there and then he then they got up and left and they did what they always did and he decided to follow them but then where he came to the, the point where they disappeared he found the termite mount 
and then he started to laugh and he said I know that the portal opens like this pip do you see and now close portal kaboom and Waita went forward into the the women's village and he found himself in a really big village and then he heard something he heard woo and the atmosphere in the village um, suddenly changed as he heard this and he heard this thing from up above and suddenly he felt really terrified it was very scary and what it was that he heard was the elder called Ijengi and then Waita decided to hide himself away in the village until the evening and then at, in the evening he got up and he saw an entrance path that led to the house of an old woman and he crept, he crept forward quietly to the front of the house and when the old woman saw him she said hi it's Waito what you hear over there Waito is a terrible thing that kills people so she took Waito in and kept him safe inside her home uh, but then later on that night a dance began and the women started playing the drums really hard and the Ejengi came out and the women were dancing with Ejengi but the Ejengi said the smell of this village has changed what is this thing that smells so strongly in this in the village and the old woman said to the women uh, the old woman said to the women who were outdoors uh, dancing with the Ejengi do you know someone called Waito and they said we know him and she said that he's in my house so Waito was ready uh, and he said he will dance till daybreak and these are all my women and he then he then spent all night dancing with these women and being with these women and then when morning arrived Waito heard a jengi again and he ran away because he was afraid and he crossed a great river and came back to the portal and he took out his magic gum and he put it back on the portal and it opened and then he um, he, he said kapem and it closed and he left and he went home and then he returned to the uh, to the other men and he said we must break all of the buku fruit break all of those things in the forest so he went home and he broke all of his buku and the other men didn't believe it so they refused to break their buku and Waito then brought all of his brothers together and he said elders I've seen many many women and then the sunbird came along and vouched that Waito was uh, saying was the truth and they said tomorrow the young men must come together and we will find those women fishing so then the next day when the young men arrived at the place and saw the woman Waito said now do you understand what it is that you were denying that here are these women and when they saw the women they embraced Waito and uh, they were very happy but Waito said I'm the owner of the path and he used the magic gum to open it up and the men were amazed and they arrived at the great river and then they heard the Ejengi with their own ears and Waito said do you hear that it's a dangerous it's dangerous out there do you understand uh, so they set out until they got to the home of the old woman and Waito went inside and spoke to her and then the music started getting louder and louder and it was really terrifying with the Ejengi out there and the Ejengi said the smell of the village has changed and he came out and the old woman then hid the young men away and said wait here until sunrise and they waited there in her house and then in the morning Ejengi returned back to his home in the forest uh, and the young men decided to take two or three women each and there were even those men who took four women each and Waita had of course had his share of women in advance and then they decided to go so the women lined up with all of their many belongings and they left and Waita walked at the back with an, uh, another elder but Ejengi uh, who was nearby in the forest heard how silent the women's village had been left and he decided to come after them 
So um, they heard a jenki coming after them and they ran, but a jenki had already got up to full speed. So Waito took out his magic gum and he started to use it by throwing it at a jenki. And by throwing the magic gum at a jenki, he managed to tame him with this magic gum. And then they luckily came to the portal in time and another person was ready with a piece of magic gum and opened up the portal. Waito was at the back with a jenki behind him. And Ajengi was really angry and he, he, he still wasn't completely tamed yet so he tried to rouse up the term, termite mound and uh, you know get the, the termites to attack people. Um, but Waito sprinkled him with some more magic gum and Ajengi grew weaker. And then everyone left that way. So when Ajengi arrived at the men's village uh, along with the women he looked around him and he was still unhappy and he was going to break everything. But they took two of the women they, and they said, here are your two wives. So that's how they set up a home for Ijengi with his own wives. And the women arranged his house for him. And then he bonded with the men. And now Ijengi is there for the men. Okay, so similarities. Anyone? Right, so um, you have the, the situation where uh, they're living in independent groups and th it's, the, it's the women who have a jengi and they both go uh, to, to uh, the women's village. Except for um, the, um, the women's version of the Mbijele myth where actually uh, it's, uh, it's Toli who goes and you know she's told where the men's village is in a dream and she, she goes there. So. Yeah, but th th there's that similarity. So they're clearly of the same origin, these two myths, um, that, you know, uh, there's that basic similarity. Um, okay, and um, the fact that the, you have these uh, two separate uh, groups uh, kind of emphasizes the fact that uh, the men and the women could potentially be economically uh, independent from one another actually. So you know the women are able to sustain themselves and actually reproduce on their own as well and the men you know are in their part of the world. I don't know how they would have managed to make babies but you know they, they're kind of independent economically they do their hunting. So that kind of emphasizes that no, neither the men nor the women are actually economically more dependent on the other gender. Um, they're kind of interdependent, uh, so you know, working together means that they can exploit a, a lot more resources in the forest uh, through that division of labor, but there isn't like economic uh, dependence. Uh, but um, you can see the Baka, the, the Baka myth is, is kind of changing a little bit um, over there. Um, so, not much charm going on. Not, so not much so charm. Much charm. No honey. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any honey? Well, the, yeah. So, so uh, this thing about the Red River hogs. Yeah. The women keep asking, you know, can you go and hunt for these Red yeah. River hogs? But that doesn't. Produce, <laughs> no, he doesn't. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a priority for him to actually just go and do what they ask, which maybe would have, I don't know, in my mind, made things a bit simpler if they'd just <laughs> done that. <Yes. laughs> But that doesn't happen, which is really interesting, actually. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's almost as if the women are identical. The women are themselves the hogs; they keep disappearing. So you've got the hogs. Right. Your story of the wild pigs um, <coughs> being hunted, so the women are identified with the pigs. That's also subject. true. Yeah. But in the Baka story, they just keep disappearing. Yes. Yes. So uh, yeah, that, I mean that's an interesting difference. Um, so they, 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 uh, in both stories, they um, they're using this kind of uh, calabash fruit. The men are using that fruit. Uh, it's not really, you know, it's kind of uh, the way it was told to me. Everyone already knows the story. They've heard it many times, so they know that that's what the men are doing. Um, so the only time that's referred to is when um, they talk about throwing away the, the book of fruit. But it's kind of implied that that's actually what, what they were doing, that the women are a replacement for that, that book of fruit. 
And I might not have actually really understood that story that well and what was going on there unless I'd already read the Mbengele version actually. So um, that's kind of interesting. Um, all right. I, tradition, I was recently retold the myth yes. uh, a couple of years ago. And one of the old ladies, she had a different name for Tuli, um, Mebonga. Mebonga. And at the end she said, uh, and the men, they loved having sex with the women so much. <laughs> this young man said, I want three of them. And this other one said, I want four, I want two. And Mebonga said, one woman, one <laughs> penis. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the law. Right, so that's the key thing actually that I wanted to draw your attention to. In the... In both the Vangelia versions, it's, it's one man and, and one woman. And in the Baka version, it's very different. It's almost like a male fantasy where there are so many women that each person can have, you know, like two, three, four, even five uh, wives. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that, that's kind of a very different thing, actually. Uh, also, um, notice that in the Vangelia version, it's really... Um, in both in, in both scenarios, the men go back to the women's village. In the Baka version, the women are kind of rounded up by the men with all their possessions, and they marched into, uh, yeah, right. And the, the choice of the women isn't really inf emphasized. It's just you know it kind of just all happens, yeah. And just the, the house, the, the the man takes refuge in the older woman's house. So that older woman is kind of acting as a bit of a traitor. She's a bit of a traitor <laughs> to the <laughs> other women, mm -hmm. in hiding yeah. the woman, the, the man from the the fear of the Ajengi. Yes. And it, it's actually got a bit of a parallel with the Hadza story of the origins of Epine, when. Um, a woman who is going to be the treacherous woman who doesn't take part in epine when women have epine yes she is put into a little box hat which she can't see out of this house and the, her husband has told her to stay in there until he reveals the fact that the the epine women have been overcome by the men and had epine stolen so it's quite interesting having this kind of enclosure on the man who mm -hmm. can have the secret revealed to him. Right. Somewhere. It's interesting, yes. I mean, um, the, the sunbird as well is, um, so the sunbird is Komba. Yeah. Uh, the sunbird represents God, uh, actually, in, in Baka mythology. So uh, it's sort of this idea that, you know, God really wanted, uh, he, you know, he helped Waiito by giving him these, like, you know, the, 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 the string and the, um, the magic paste. Um, and he had this idea that he wanted the two genders to, to come together, but, you know, uh, through Waito. And the old woman is maybe, I don't know, maybe it's from a, a previous version that, you know, was more gender egalitarian, where that old woman was maybe uh, also a bit like a, a god figure, actually. Is the sunbird explicitly like solar, or is it just the name of the bird? Sun, well, it's called a sunbird. Uh, it, it's the the equivalent of a hummingbird in Africa. They're called sunbirds. Oh, um, so that's not the the Baka uh, word for uh, the Baka word is sese. Um, but uh, it's it's called a sunbird because it's so iridesc iridescent. There are lots of different species, and they're very colourful, um, and they look really beautiful in the sunlight. Um, yeah. So is that the end? It's, it's, it's kind of the end. I just wanted you to think about how that, you know, how those, uh, th those kind of social changes are so entwined with rituals, okay. really. Thank you yeah. very, very much.